Hello everyone, Professor Helmling here. So when thinking about discourse, there are two elements of academic discourse and writing and reading that we can think of as, as being at work uh, almost all the time when we're, when we're engaged in academic discourse. And one of those is analysis, and I always say that analytical thinking is the bedrock of academic thinking, academic writing, academic reading, and so academic discourse. You know, thinking analytically where we're taking things apart, figuring out how they work, that's really central to what academia is all about. Another important element is rhetoric. And rhetoric is the art of persuasion, the art of communicating your ideas and trying to convince other people that your ideas are valid, are right. Um, so obviously, rhetoric is a big part of argument and argumentation. But we see these two elements at work in a lot of academic discourse. And uh, what we're going to look at today is a piece. It's a historical text. And it's one that I always describe as a introductory course to rhetoric in and of itself. It's got so many good techniques, so many good moves going on in the text that it's a really good primer, a really good introduction to rhetoric and how it works in historical texts, but also how it can work in texts that we're going to write in this course. So the document I'm talking about, as you can see here from this sample page from the syllabus, is Patrick Henry's speech to the Virginia Convention. And this is a historical text written during the American Revolution. It's arguably the most famous uh, speech from the American Revolution. Uh, it's often um, taught in basic courses on uh, this, this period in history, along with things like um, uh, Paine's Common Sense, the Declaration of Independence, right down there, um, and the Constitution itself. So, and one of the great things about it is that it's easy to study because it's actually really short. Um, and so Patrick Henry packs in a lot of rhetorical power, a lot of rhetorical techniques in a very short speech. And um, he is one of the revolutionaries, considered one of our founding fathers because of this speech. And uh, he is speaking to the, the assembly of representatives for Virginia as they consider what to do about the trouble between Great Britain and her American colonies. And of course, we know that this is leading to a full-fledged revolution that will result in the creation of the United States. Um, but of course, they don't know that at the time that he's delivering this speech. And so there's a lot of people who are wary of conflict. They're worried about what could happen. There's a lot of people who are loyalists to the crown. And there are people like Patrick Henry and the other founding fathers who believe that they should rebel and form a new nation. So let's go ahead and go into this digital version of the speech. And it is frequently um, titled, Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death, and you'll see why when we get to the very famous last line. But again, the actual title is The Speech to the Virginia Convention. As you can see, it was delivered in 1775. Uh, so before the um, Declaration of Independence. So, as I said, <clears throat> he is going to be addressing his beliefs that it is time for the colonies to rebel and to become the United States. So, we're going to go paragraph by paragraph and just analyze his different moves, his different rhetorical strategies and techniques uh, as he makes this case. So let's just read through this first paragraph together, and then I'll go back and kind of unpack for you some of the things that I think are important going on in, in here. And then, of course, you'll have a chance to discuss uh, later anything else that you think is worth talking about in here. So he begins. <clears throat> no man thinks more highly than I do of the patriotism as well as abilities of the very worthy gentlemen who have just addressed the house. But different men often see the same subject in different lights, and therefore I hope it will not be thought disrespectful to those gentlemen if, entertaining as I do, opinions of a character very opposite to theirs, I shall speak forth my sentiments freely and without reserve. This is no time for ceremony. The question before the house is one of awful moment to this country. 
For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery, and in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. It is only in this way that we can hope to arrive at truth and fulfill the great responsibility which we hold to God and our country. Should I keep back my opinions at such a time through fear of giving offense, I should consider myself as guilty of treason towards my country and of an act of disloyalty toward the majesty of heaven, which I revere above all earthly kings. So in this opening paragraph, one of the things that we want to look at, and really this is something to look at it whenever we're analyzing rhetoric or any academic writing, any writing at all, one great thing to look at is tone. And sometimes the tone of a piece will be consistent throughout. But one of the most skillful things that an author can do is shift and change their tone very deliberately through the course of a piece of writing to accomplish their purpose. Now, we already know that Patrick Henry's purpose is to convince people that they should join the revolution, that they need a revolution against Great Britain. But let's look at how he begins. First of all, look, he says here at the beginning, no man thinks more highly than I do of the patriotism, et cetera, et cetera, of the very worthy gentleman who just addressed the house. Now, who do you suppose he's talking about? Who just addressed the house? He says that his opinions have a character very opposite to theirs. So he's talking about some loyalists, loyalists to Great Britain, to the crown, who just addressed the Virginia Convention and said, whoa, we, we can't consider revolution. Britain is our sovereign. King George is our king. You know, no, we can't, we can't revolt. And so he's disagreeing with them. He thinks they're wrong. Very wrong. He's willing to take up arms that he, because he believes they're so wrong. But look how he addresses them here. What are they? They are very worthy gentlemen. And look how diplomatic his tone is here. He's practically apologizing for disagreeing with them. He's saying, um, you know, uh, it, I really, I've got to speak my mind. I've just got to. I know I, I don't want to give offense. I'm so sorry, he ba he's basically saying. I'm, I'm so sorry to have to say this, but, you know, I really feel like I, I have to speak my mind. So please don't think it's disrespectful. So his tone here at the opening is very conciliatory. It's very diplomatic. And this is how he opens the stage. Now, this is very similar to something that um, you see in another classic piece of rhetoric that's studied uh, as an example of how to work an audience, how to work a crowd, and how to get them on your side. Uh, and that is the Mark Anthony speech from William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. And what happens in that situation is the senators, the Roman senators, fearing that Julius Caesar is seizing power, absolute power in Rome, they decide he must be eliminated, and they, they assassinate him. And his friend, Mark Anthony, then, is kind of on the outs, because his biggest ally was Caesar, and now he's dead. So he, he's a little bit lacking in power. Um, so at Caesar's funeral, he wants to sway the people to his side. But he opens, very much as Patrick Henry does here, and, you know, he, he says, well, Brutus and the other senators who killed Caesar, they say he was ambitious and had to die, well, and I know they are very honorable men, so they must have been right. So he opens with this very diplomatic and, and uh, conciliatory tone, just like Patrick Henry is doing here, but then by, he slowly shifts that throughout that speech, and by the end of it, when he says they're very honorable men, his his words are just dripping with irony and, and sarcasm, and he has completely twisted the knife on them. Now, Patrick Henry isn't going to be quite that harsh to these very worthy gentlemen with whom he completely disagrees, but we're going to watch how he does shift the tone. He opens here very diplomatic, very conciliatory, but he's going to shift that tone as he goes. Okay, so that's the first paragraph. Now, he also introduces uh, a very important concept, uh, a dichotomy here, that is going to be running throughout the speech. And he is saying that this question they're considering, whether to stay loyal to Britain or to revolt, is a question of freedom versus slavery. So let's watch how he continues with that idea. Next paragraph here. 
By the way, he says Mr. President at the beginning of this paragraph, but remember, there is no United States. This is not the President of the United States. This is the President of the Convention that he's addressing. He says, Mr. President, it is natural to man to indulge in the illusions of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes against a painful truth and listen to the song of that siren till she transforms us into beasts. Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be of the number of those who, having eyes, see not, and having ears, hear not? The things which so nearly concern their temporal salvation? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. Okay, so right away, let's look at how he's changing the tone. Up above, the very worthy gentleman he didn't want to disrespect. Now, how is he portraying them? He's kind of casting some aspersions on them here. They were very worthy gentlemen with whom he just happened to disagree in the first paragraph. But now, they are indulging in the illusions of hope. And look at the word choice there. This is how tone is created. Very carefully chosen diction. The words he uses illusions of hope so so he's shifting the tone already so they were very worthy gentlemen but now they're indulging in the illusions of hope now he also does something really good here another important rhetorical device he says the song of that siren now of course this is the 18th century he can't possibly be talking about sirens on the top of police cars what kind of sirens is he talking about and if you know your mythology, you may recognize the siren as a figure from Greek mythology, specifically from the Odyssey. And in the Odyssey, the sirens were monsters who sang this beautiful song, so beautiful that sailors couldn't resist it, could not resist it, and they sailed their ships right into the rocks to be close to it, and that's where the sirens got to eat them up. So a siren song is something that sounds great, but is dangerous and deceptive. Okay, so he's saying that this hope that the very worthy gentlemen are hanging on to is a siren song. It is dangerous. And then notice that he also engages in some good old-fashioned rhetorical questions. And he's saying, is, you know, what is it that really matters to us? Does liberty really matter to us? If it does, then we need to be wiser than to listen to these illusions of hope. And again, tone is still still pretty conciliatory. He says at the end, forever, for my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, no matter how, how hard it is for me to accept this, I'm going to face the truth. And you know what? If the truth is terrible, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with it. I'm going to prepare for it. So see, now he's kind of communicating that to those, quote, very worthy gentlemen who've been, in his eyes, indulging in the illusions of hope. So the tone is shifting. All right, let's look at this big old paragraph here. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know of no way of judging of the future but by the past. And judging by the past, I wish to know what there has been in the conduct of the British ministry for the last 10 years to justify those hopes with which, with which gentlemen have been pleased to solace themselves and the house. Is it the insidious smile with which our petition has been lately received? Trust it not, sir. It will prove a snare to your feet. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss. Ask yourselves how this gracious reception of our petition comports with those warlike preparations which cover our waters and darken our land. Are fleets and armies necessary to a work of love and reconciliation? Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called to win back our love? Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation, the last argument to which kings resort. Okay, I'm going to pause there because this is such a long paragraph. There's so much already just in this little section we read to unpack. First of all, Something very interesting here. I have but one lamp. Now, is Patrick Henry talking about a literal lamp that he's holding in his hand there in the convention floor? No. So this is obviously figurative language. And since he's not saying, you know, experience is like a lamp, he's saying it is a lamp, this is a metaphor. 
Now, what's interesting here is that this metaphor is doing something really cool. Usually, when we use figurative language, we're trying to appeal to the emotions of our audience. We're trying to sway them emotionally. Uh, a broad appeal that Aristotle called pathos. When you appeal to the emotions of your audience, you're using pathos. On the other hand, if you're appealing to their logic, to their sense of reason, then you're appealing to what he called logos. And what's interesting here is that this metaphor is really more of a logos metaphor because he's saying, how can we predict the future? Well, logically, there's only one way to do that. Study the past, learn the pattern, infer from it, and that's how we can make predictions about the future. That is his lamp that guides him, is understanding the past sheds light on the future. So it's a really interesting use of metaphor because, like I said, metaphor and simile, figurative language like that is usually more of an emotional appeal, but here he's using it for a logical purpose. And again, we see a lot more of these good uh, 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 rhetorical questions, you know. But there's one other important uh, technique he does here. Suffer not yourselves to betray be betrayed with a kiss. Just like the reference to the siren up above, this is an illusion. Remember, that's illusion with an A, not illusion. Illusion. And an illusion, remember, is a reference that you have to have some background knowledge to get. Now, with the siren, there was that one word cluing us in. It's like, siren, what's the siren? And if you didn't know what the siren was, you might, you might have to go look it up. This illusion is a little bit more subtle. Suffer not yourselves to be betrayed with a kiss. What, what is he talking about? We're talking about a revolution against Britain, and you're talking about kissing all of a sudden. What? So, if you know your New Testament, then you will recognize that this is an allusion to the Bible. And... When Judas betrays Jesus in the New Testament, he identifies him to the Romans who are going to imprison him with a kiss. He walks up to him and says, greets his rabbi and kisses him on the cheek. And that is where this idea of being betrayed by a kiss comes from. And so this is an allusion to Judas in the New Testament. Now look what he's done here. At the very beginning, the people who disagreed with him are very worthy gentlemen. Then they're indulging in the illusion of hope. Now they're letting themselves be betrayed by a kiss. And so this also casts Great Britain as Judas, as the great betrayer. And so he's saying to the loyalists, you're going along with Judas. So a lot of good, good rhetorical moves he's making here. Also, just look at some of his diction and his language here, this uh, casting the, the portrait of what's going on here. You know, the um, warlike preparations cover our waters and darken our land. Very dramatic. So he is using pathos with, with these images, the imagery that he's using. And again, we've got the rhetorical questions and everything. So, so much going on in this paragraph. I had to stop midway through. But let's, let's read through the rest of this paragraph. I ask, gentlemen, sir, what means this martial array if its purpose be not to force us into submission? Continuing with these rhetorical questions. Can gentlemen assign any other possible motive for it? Has Great Britain any enemy in this quarter of the world to call for all this accumulation of navies and armies? No, sir, she has none. They are meant for us. They can be meant for no other. They are sent over to bind and rivet upon us those chains which the British ministry has been so long forging. Pausing again here to break down what he's doing here. More logos, more logic. And remember, the founding fathers were big believers in the Enlightenment. So they were really um, people who pray, placed primacy on reason. They believed that through reason, individuals and society were perfectible. So it's no surprise that we see such a heavy reliance on Logos. And so you see his logical argument. They're sending ships and fleets. Why? Do they have any enemies here? No. Therefore, we must conclude these are meant to subjugate us. So again, a lot of Logos built into this. Alongside these very strong pathos appeals, because then he goes immediately into 
there are binding and riveting chains upon us. And see how chains are again connecting the imagery of freedom versus slavery that he's um, already introduced earlier. And so now he's going to continue with the logic and he's going to say, okay, what, what's happened in the past? We're going to look at what that lamp shows us and what can we conclude from it? What have we to oppose them? Shall we try argument? Sir, we have been trying that for the last 10 years. Have we anything new to offer upon the subject? Nothing. We have held the subject up in every light of which it is capable, but it has been all in vain. Shall we resort to entreaty and humble supplication? What terms shall we find which have not already been exhausted? Let us not, I beseech you, sir, deceive ourselves. Sir, we have done everything that could be done to avert the storm which is now coming on. We have petitioned, we have remonstrated, we have supplicated, we have prostrated ourselves before the throne and have implored its interposition to arrest the tyrannical hands of the ministry and parliament. Our petitions have been slighted. Our remonstrances have produced additional violence and assault. Our supplications have been disregarded, and we have been spurned with contempt from the foot of the throne. In vain, after all these things, may we indulge in the fond hope of peace and reconciliation. There is no longer any room for hope. If we wish to be free, if we mean to preserve and violate those inestimable privileges for which we have been so long contending, if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle in which we have been so long engaged, in which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest shall be obtained, we must fight. I repeat it, sir, we must fight. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that is left to us. Look at the tone shift there. From, hey, at the very beginning, he's like, hey, guys, I don't mean to offend anyone, but I just think maybe we should think about this. That's his tone in the beginning. Now he's all, we must fight. Big tone shift that he's executed to this point. Look at some of the other moves here, starting up here. This is what we call parallel structure. So all of these clauses through here have the same basic structure. We have this, we have this, we have this, we have this. Okay, and then he continues the parallel structure with what's happened because of that. Our this have been this. <laughs> Our petitions have been slighted. Our remonstrances have been have produced. Our supplications have been disregarded. Okay, so see how he's got this parallel structure. Parallelism is used in a lot of rhetoric, and it kind of builds energy for a moment like this in a speech, where it's like, we're piling on evidence. You're piling on the thinking to try to make your case seem the most reasonable. So parallel structure there is an important rhetorical technique to look at. All right, so let's look at the next paragraph. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be next week or the next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed, and when a British guard shall be stationed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by lying supinely on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope, until our enemies shall have bound us hand and foot? Sir, we are not weak if we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. The millions of people armed in the holy cause of liberty and in such a country as that which we possess are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations and who will raise up friends to fight our battles for us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, sir, we have no election. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission and slavery. Our chains are forged. Our, their clanking may be heard on the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable and let it come. I repeat it, sir. Let it come. Okay, so we've talked already about the tone through here, the shifting tone. You know, up above we had the noble struggle, the glorious object. And so here we have the holy cause of liberty and that we would be invincible. So he's using very carefully selected diction to shift that tone and to really portray their cause as noble, as glorious, and to 
counter the objections. And that's really what this whole paragraph is. It's a great big counter argument. Now, counter argument is when you, as the author of the rhetoric, anticipate what someone else is going to say back to you. You anticipate their objections. And so with counter argument, you're like, well, they may say this, but here's why they're wrong. And here, that's exactly how it starts. They tell us that we are weak. So this is what a lot of people, not I mean, obviously the loyalists, but also the guys in the middle that I talked about. People are like, I, 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 don't, I don't think we can win this conflict. I mean, Great Britain was the world's first truly global superpower. You know, They were the only country in history at that point that had had such global power. And so it's like, you know, these, these colonists, they've got to be thinking, how could we possibly win? against the British Empire. We're not strong enough. And so he presents a couple of counters to say, well, wait, you, know, you haven't considered this. First of all, he says, oh, they say we're weak, but how are we going to get stronger if we continue to let them subjugate us? If we let them build up more forces, if, they, if we let them put a British guard in every house, how can we possibly have the strength to stand up to them? And are we going to get stronger by doing nothing? So he's saying we can't just lie supinely on our backs. We have to stand up for ourselves. Whether we're strong enough or not, doesn't matter. We're only going to get weaker if we let them. But he doesn't rest there. He turns around and says, and you know what? We're not actually weak. Okay? We're not actually weak. What have we got? We've got millions of people in the colonies. We've got uh, a knowledge of the country. We know the train this in the country that we possess. But he also makes a, 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 an oblique reference here. He says, besides, we won't fight alone. Friends will be raised up for us. And of course, anybody who knows the history of the American Revolution knows that we, the United States only prevailed, the colonies only prevailed uh, because of help from Great Britain's enemy, the French. Um, so he's kind of wink wink nod, nod nudge nudging that too so he's like hey remember guys great britain though they are powerful is not unopposed and their enemies will stand with us because they'll want to see them weakened all right so as you can see a lot of masterful stuff going on in here with his rhetorical techniques we've seen metaphors we've seen allusions we've seen lots of rhetorical questions parallel structure skillful use of tone now we have this counter argument and it's almost over I told you this is real short. This is the end right here. It is in vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, peace, but there is no peace. The war is actually begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field. Why stand we here idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what other course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Of course, that's the famous closing line. But in that famous closing line, we have one more rhetorical technique, antithesis. Antithesis is when you set up as you know the engineer of this rhetoric, you set up a, a dichotomous choice like that. And we, we've seen him do this before, the freedom slavery. Um, where it's this or that, and you're putting them in stark contrast for your audience and saying, which of these do you really want? So antithesis, and that's spelled just like antithesis, but it's not exactly related to thesis like in your thesis essays, or your thesis statements in your essays. So that is Patrick Henry's speech to the Virginia, Con Virginia Convention, which, as I said before, I consider a brief introductory course to the art of rhetoric in and of itself. There's so many good techniques here. Um, and I didn't necessarily point out everything that's great in here, so we can discuss more uh, in the future about what else do you see him doing here. But those are some of the big moves that I want to make sure you were aware of in this piece.